we're going to talk about defining the relational objects, mapping to, to backends, and then some of our, our big enterprise-grade features around conflict resolution, client and server-side filters, and object-object relationships, and then code generation and SDK. Now, with Sync, there's so much happening under the covers that there's really not a demo I can show you that they really get some of these key points around what's different in our Sync server. So if you look at this diagram, you know, basic synchronization will get you some simple data from the back end. Maybe there's some, some translation that does because a lot of existing solutions only put name value pairs or JSON objects on the device. But what our customers need is to get the same relational data model that's in the back end on the device so that you have transactional context, you have object relationships, and you're changing the data on the device as close to what the back end expects as possible. And when you do that, then you can add in all these additional features around specifying client filters on the device or server filters in the back end to really get granular on how much data is pushed to the device and make sure it's all relevant. You can track conflicts. You can do conflicts replay or, or review what conflicts have been automatically resolved based on your uh, conflict uh, policy. You can do batching and chunking. So batching to send back bigger, bigger pieces of data or chunking when you actually break it up in really small pieces to make sure you can get that big data to the device that may have bad network connectivity. You can maintain tra transactional context, and you can even keep a persistent cache of data right in the sync server. So if the back end's not always available, the sync services in the middle always have a copy of the data, so you're actually just syncing against the mobile fabric layer and not the back end if it's not highly available. So. I've cut this down really, really small uh, to keep this as concise as possible. I think everyone's pretty familiar with the use case of Sync, but the sample application that we built, and I'm going to show you how we created it, is a basic CRM app built off of Salesforce. So in this case, we're going to change contact, his data on the device, and as you saw when the video started, that we're offline. We put it in airplane mode. We disconnected. This is on a simulator, so we disconnected the laptop network to make sure that we weren't online. So as soon as we save it, it's, it's saving it locally to a relational database, uh, SQLite, on the device. And then it realize that it can't, it can't talk to the back end. So it, it has it. It knows you're offline. So that change hasn't been propagated back because we're not connected. The next thing is we'll, we'll then reconnect this device quickly. And then in this particular demo app, there's a little button at the top right we're going to click that basically invokes our SDK that says, just sync all the changes. Just look at all my objects and just sync what's changed. But the developer can really put this anywhere he wants to. He can give the user an explicit sync button like we've done here. So we've clicked the sync button, and it's going to call our SDK, and we're going to look at the objects, and we're going to sync anything from any side that's, that's uh, needed. Or they can write their own code and and do this manually if they really want to get fine grain on what they want to think when. So you can prioritize certain data. So this screen was loaded before we made the change. We refreshed the screen. Uh, Sean Forbes has moved to the top because he was changed most recently. His phone number's changed. His last name's changed like we did. So pretty simple demo, but I just want to get across the application that we've built to demonstrate this. So let me show you how this is built on the back end. So we're going into uh, an app that's already been built. Most services have already been created. The, the Salesforce back end, as you guys are aware, has different objects, accounts, contacts, leads, opportunities. So I'm going to go through and show you how we connected to the contact object, because that's the one we just saw play in that demo. First thing we need to do is connect the identity service. It's as simple as just creating one more new identity service, choosing the type of identity as Salesforce. So here we're, we're giving it a name, and then we'll choose identity. As you can see, we've got several different things we can do here, Active Directory, Salesforce, uh, SAML, which includes ADFS, SAP, we have Facebook, Social Connector, and also Custom. In the case of Custom, you can build an integration service to anything, and as long as you give us a login operation, a logout, and, and obviously a refresh operation, you can use that. So you really can connect the identity to anything now. Uh, but in the case of Salesforce, we can do OAuth, or we can go direct over XML if we want to build our own login page. Um, in this case, for Salesforce, we have to go and get the key in secret. So we're just showing that you, you go to the Salesforce console, you have to create, obviously, a connected app, generate a key in secret. But that's all we need. Once that's done, then now we can connect to Salesforce and log our user in using his own Salesforce credentials. And if you did choose to do this via OAuth and not direct, then the SDK will automatically pop the Salesforce HTML login page in line using a web view. Or if you choose just straight user ID password, 
then you can build your own login page and send it via their REST API. Now, connecting to contacts, we build an integration service first because we're going to use what we call metadata discovery. So by connecting to Salesforce, we can pull back all the objects and we can just choose the object we want. There's no need to do all this uh, XML parsing anymore because Salesforce gives us enough metadata about the objects it exposes. So we can just allow the developer to pick what he wants to use and pick the operations that he wants to enable for his application. So we chose uh, our Salesforce identity service saying that's how we're going to authenticate. We've already created an identity service, so we just want to use that. It's pulled back all the objects. So you can see a big list of Salesforce objects here, including any custom objects we've created. We're going to choose the contact object, and it's going to query Salesforce and bring back all the methods that that object supports. And then as a developer, I can decide which one of those I want to expose to my application. Uh, in this case, we're doing sync. We really need all of them because we want to be able to not only read the object, but update it, delete it, and create contacts. So it's going to bring in all the data about these different objects and how to parse them out of the REST XML. So there's nothing else to do now. All of it's uh, ready to go. Then we go to the sync tab. So what we want to do is we want to build an object off of this uh, contact API that we imported from Salesforce. So the first thing we have to do is define our object. It gives us the ability to, to create a custom object if we want to, but we really just want to generate the object uh, to look exactly like Salesforce. So this goes back to keeping the objects on our device looking exactly like they are in the back end. And then we tell the sync service how to know if that object's been modified. So we tell it which attribute to keep an eye on to know if it's changed in the back end. And also if there's a soft delete flag we can watch, which is, is deleted, uh, we can configure that as well. And then lastly, we have to specify the lifecycle methods. This is just mapping the object to the APIs to control this object. Anytime we want to create a contact, then we need to map it to the API that Salesforce gave us. But everything can be generated. We can generate the mapping between the object attributes and the API that Salesforce gave us to actually create a contact. So all this, all this uh, configuration was generated for us by clicking that button. And then there's uh, the output mapping is done for us. And there's one, in this case, there's one custom header that we need to create for Salesforce, which so we can modify the headers and what we send to them if we need to. So there's a lot of power in the middle. I know we're kind of jumping through this pretty quickly. Uh, but for example, we need to send in the uh, content type specifically as XML to Salesforce or it won't give us back the, the data. So this is an example of where we can go and set custom headers if we need to. And this can be done with any API. So in this case, we're doing Salesforce API, but if you had custom REST or SOAP services, you can map all of this to that as well. So we're going to publish that, but just to recap, we did an identity service to Salesforce. We imported the contact object in integration. So at this point, we could even call that API live if we wanted to. It will expose that to our app. And then for synchronization, we built a, a contact sync object and then just bound it directly to the Salesforce API and chose the exact same relational model that Salesforce exposes for that object, which means that's exactly what will get provisioned on the device. So I can work with that contact object on the device just like Salesforce expects it. Okay, so here's a really cool thing. So once we've deployed it to the environment, it'll give you all the client code that you need for any of the SDKs we support. So if you notice here, if we click iOS, what it's going to do is it's going to generate the client object code and the methods needed to manage those objects on the device for us. And then we're going to pull that into an Xcode project, and we're going to have to do very little work to build a sync-enabled app. So we've downloaded this uh, zip file, and we're actually going to flip over to, uh, to Xcode to see. But those are our objects, and then there's a set of methods to help you control those objects. So on the Xcode screen, these are all of our, our objects. So we did contact. So it generated all the getters and setters and methods against this object model that I need, so I don't have to mess with this, and I know I'm going to get it right. So now I can just instantiate this object and create a new contact if I want to, and then call a method that we give you to sync it to the back end. So this is the object model. This uh, Kony sync model M, these are the methods that you can call to sync an object. So the one we give you is start sync with network options and sync objects. This one's kind of the, the powerhouse. It, it'll go through and check all the objects, or you can send it a specific object um, and sync them. Uh, that's all the code we give you. The only thing the developer has to do is here's that sync button that you saw. So we have to catch the sync button. And when they click it, then we need to then call the sync SDK and say start sync with network objects. 
and it'll do all the heavy lifting. So this code here that you see on the screen, start sync with network options and sync objects, this is really all the code we have to write if we want to just do a, a blind sync across all objects. And we, we can do some more interrogation of objects if we want to do some more complicated use cases, but typically this will this will meet the needs of most uh, offline apps. And at that point, when you build your presentation layer, you just code against that object model, and you let Sync take care of the rest. So one other thing I want to show you on the Salesforce app, this isn't Sync related because I want to kind of tease a feature that's coming up. Um, so in Salesforce, let's say we made a change on the back end, such as an opportunity. I'm sure you guys are familiar. Opportunities have uh, percentages, um, values. You move through the life cycle. So in this case, um, we're going to change a value in Salesforce for a specific opportunity. And we have a use case where we want to make sure that data gets out to the field as quickly as possible. Um, we want to send them a push message. So I want to show you how easy it is with our messaging services to get this done, and then I'm going to show you how it's configured in just a bit. But in Salesforce, we modified this particular uh, opportunity object to change its uh, percentage. And then on the device that's running the Salesforce app, we can send a push immediately to them using our messaging services. And then when they click on that notification, it'll, it'll open the app for them. And the way this is done is using our messaging services, we can configure events on the back end that can be fired from any external system like Salesforce. And this code I'm showing here on the screen is a trigger that was written in Salesforce to make that happen. So you create a trigger on the opportunity. And there's actually two things happening here. Um, the JSON at the top is how you could send a push message directly to the device, and you could create your own push JSON if you wanted to. So we have kind of an ad hoc API where you can just send data to the device as long as you know his, uh, his email address. In this case, email address is our, is our key. Our, our, uh, our consistent key between the two systems, um, or the XML at the bottom is actually firing an event. So in this case, we're only sending uh, uh, variables. We're just sending the, opp the opportunity name, the opportunity percentage, what it was and what they changed it to, and the owner's email address. And then we configure an event on the mobile fabric side to receive those variables and then construct the message that we want them to see. So we actually have the power to change the message if we want to. The only thing we need from Salesforce is just the variables to drive the message.